a lot of the skills that I learned during my undergraduate ed education, either learned or cultivated, contributed to my time in law school and now my career as a practicing attorney as well. Some of those skills are reading and writing, not surprisingly, critical thinking, objectivity, open-mindedness, and empathy. I want you to have a good idea of what a day is like for me at my job. I spend a lot of time working with people, hearing about either their goals or their problems that they're dealing with and working with them to try to find solutions. Two main areas of practice are estate planning, wills and trusts, and probate and trust administration. After someone has passed away, I help their family and loved ones navigate the probate court process here in Arizona, and sometimes a trust if they've created one. This wouldn't be a presentation from a lawyer without a disclaimer, so I will say <laughs> that I am not giving any specific legal advice today. Uh, please keep in mind that we're discussing general legal principles, but if you are ever in need of an attorney, please consult one for yourself based on your own needs. <laughs> so when it comes to my time here at ASU, I first started in a justice studies major and my first year did not go well. I think it's important for you to know that because um, I had a good, strong background in education. I did well in school up until the first year of college, um, even to the point of testing into the gifted program when I was in second grade, taking honors classes throughout high school. And freshman year of college was quite a shock for me. Um, my mom has said before that I didn't have a, a need to study when I was young. Um, I'm fortunate to have a strong background in reading and writing based on my parents encouraging me to do well in school. When I was on my own freshman year at ASU in Tempe, I didn't understand how much time it actually took to do well in classes, and I would attribute uh, the difficult time I had to a lack of preparation, which I corrected later on in my studies. A lot of that had to do with this interdisciplinary approach to learning, and I was able to focus on classes that I loved, material that I found engaging and interesting, and I could really turn around my GPA in that way once I found a different major. So I went from Justice Studies to Communications, and then I ended up on Interdisciplinary Studies. That's when I first met Professor Mananen, and I remember very vividly having a conversation with her and not knowing what I wanted to do as far as a career. And I remember Professor Mananen asking me, well, have you thought about religion and applied ethics? And at that time, I hadn't. But I'm so grateful that she saw a <coughs> potential in me to make that my major. And it's where I really found my comfort and uh, aptitude for doing well in this type of studies. As you might know, if you're familiar with the program, it did involve a lot of reading and writing about very engaging materials, and I think a lot of the professors here at ASU make a point to make it the best experience possible for the students going through. And that reading and writing allowed me to build up my study skills and my preparation skills in a way that prepared me for law school, which is one of the hardest undertakings I've had. They tell you your first year of law school will be the most difficult. And I did so much reading during that time that my eyes became fatigued and my vision was worsening because of how much reading it required. But I had built up the habits during undergraduate education of putting the time in and preparing for class. And if you've ever taken one of Dr. Anderson's religion or philosophy classes, you might know of his pop quizzes, which are very similar to law school classes, <laughs> because 
you get put on the spot and asked to analyze a case and answer questions. And you may not have had your hand raised, you just get called on. <laughs> As far as writing goes, I'm thankful for my background and experience in writing, but like I mentioned, my freshman year of college uh, was a bit surprising to me that I would submit a paper and not get a good grade on it. And it's neat to look back and see how I improved going through college. And in a way where once I went through law school and prepared for the bar exam, which is a two-day test, mm -hmm. uh, the first day is multiple choice and the second day is writing, I focused a lot of my time studying on the multiple choice. And I had good skills in writing to do well on that part of the exam, but not necessarily put as much time into doing practice writing questions because I had already done a lot of writing through undergraduate studies and I was reminded by a friend during bar exam preparation that it wasn't just those two months that I was studying for the bar exam. I had been studying for my three years in law school for the bar exam as well and that um, helped me have the confidence going in to do well on the bar exam, I was fortunate to pass the first time, which isn't always the case. And I knew that part of my struggle in preparing for the bar exam would be potentially doubting myself and my skills. And I had the opportunity to participate in a presentation offered by a hypnotherapist, which I may not have done if I wasn't as open-minded at the time but it allowed me to envision myself taking the bar exam and doing well to calm my nerves, um, to engage in positive thinking about my time taking the test so that I could leave those nerves aside and really focus on the task at hand. Another big skill in writing is knowing your audience, who you're writing to. And I think my time at ASU allowed me to prepare in a way to write for my professor who was my audience, sometimes classmates as well. But now I have a couple different audiences that I write to in practice. One major audience is judges. <laughs> Another major audience is my clients. And then a third audience is other attorneys. And what I learned in law school is you have a different approach to writing depending on who your audience is. And one example of writing to a judge is I was involved in a case where a woman had passed away and she left behind a husband and three sons. It was her wish in her will that her house would go to her husband to live in during his life but that when he passed away, it would go to her three children. This case didn't come to me until 15 years had passed since she passed away because that was how long her husband survived after her. Sometimes gaps in time like this create more issues to deal with that people don't always anticipate. And by that time, of her three sons, only two were still living. So we had a situation where the only property or asset to deal with was a house that all of the family would inherit sale proceeds from, but the grandchildren in line from her son that passed away, a few of them were incarcerated. It was difficult to contact them and get them to sign off on the sale of the house. And too much time had gone by for her estate to simply sell it. It required everyone's signatures, the two sons who were still living, as well as the three grandchildren of the son who had passed away. And in that case, it was my job to lay out the facts in a way that the judge would understand, 
There was a problem with the will as well, even though it was drafted by an attorney, it wasn't witnessed properly. The will didn't have the necessary language to say that she signed in the presence of two witnesses, she knew what she was signing, and the witnesses need to sign and say that they did this in her presence. That's what the will was missing. It didn't have the necessary witness requirements. And I had to consult the Arizona statute or the Arizona law to determine what I had to show in my writing to the judge that would prove that this was her will. It was clearly a testamentary instrument. She wanted it to apply if she passed away. It just didn't meet Arizona's legal requirements. But the law says that you can introduce extrinsic evidence, outside evidence, to prove that it is a will. And I took that rule in the law, I need extrinsic evidence, and I applied it to the situation. With my paralegal's help, I tracked down the one surviving witness of three involved, because remember, this was many years later, and this witness signed an affidavit saying that she was there when the will was signed. That was her signature on this document. And I took that in front of the judge and had all the necessary steps laid out to prove that this was her will, also that we could carry out her wishes and have a house sold. And so we reached a good result in that case, but it required me laying all of that out in a way that was clear and direct for the judge, but also included all of the necessary requirements. And this wasn't a situation where anyone was objecting. But the judge said that many people come in his courtroom and don't lay out all of, that, all of those steps. They just bring the will and say, judge, accept the will. And I am thankful that he noticed all of the work that I had done and that it resulted in a good outcome for my client. And my writing skills are just one part of that. So you can probably tell from that example that critical thinking goes into this as well. And one neat part about critical thinking is creativity too. So one of my favorite memories from my time here at ASU was during a class that Professor Matushtik taught. And in that class, we read a book called In the Sacred and the Profane by Mircea Eliad. And Professor Matushtik asked us to show an artistic representation of that text. And so I remember one of my classmates wrote a screenplay. <laughs> that is one that stuck out to me. For my artistic presentation, I played a song on the piano and recorded it, and a friend helped me cut it up in pieces that made sense to represent what I read. I am not an experienced pianist, <laughs> but I enjoy playing the piano, and it allowed me to express creativity in a way that I didn't expect in a class on research and writing and applied ethics. And what I find now in my work, too, is that creativity comes up. We're working within the bounds of the law, but we have goals to balance, um, meeting solutions for our clients, of course, but also understanding the procedure behind it in a way that can help them accomplish what they need. If a client is asking me for something that just isn't possible within the bounds of the law, I need to express that to them and present alternatives. Another skill that's important is objectivity. And I think that so much of what I did in my applied ethics classes was to learn how to analyze and argue for different points of view. And this really helped me during law school because I was on what's called honor court. 
my first year of law school, I was invited to be one of five people who would hear uh, alleged violations of the code of conduct. Uh, perhaps cheating would become an issue. And there was one case that, became, that came before the court that had to do with my classmates, a violation that allegedly occurred during a test that I was taking. And I wanted to have an opportunity to serve in this role of honor court justice and do what I was asked to do, but I really wrestled with the decision of whether I could participate since this involved my classmates. And I sought advice from a professor who had a background as a judge. I spoke about this issue with the justices who served with me as well. And even though I thought that I was capable of assisting in this proceeding, I ultimately declined. I ultimately recused myself and a different person replaced me. And it all was tied to the perception of whether I could be objective. Sure, I thought I could do it, but what mattered most is how would my participation be perceived and ultimately it was best for everyone involved that I stepped aside. And so objectively analyzing that situation and taking myself out of it and how I felt out of it was ultimately I think what was best for everyone involved. Another skill that I've found directly from my undergraduate studies is open-mindedness. I'll give you a bit of a background on me so that you can understand the progression in my life. So when I was young, I was raised as a Christian, as a Lutheran, and I'm thankful for that upbringing. It gave me a real sense of community. And when I was a freshman in high school, we were assigned a research project on religions, and I chose Christianity right away. And it wasn't until my friend said, oh, of course you did, Christine. Uh, I realized that maybe choosing a different one to research, a different religion to research, would have given me the opportunity to learn and grow. That's what my undergraduate education allowed me to do, to learn and grow and understand more about world religions and ways of thinking that I wouldn't have otherwise known if I hadn't had this education. And this open-mindedness is relevant to my practice because I often assist people who have certain religious beliefs about what will happen when they pass away. Um, often it has to do with end-of-life treatment wishes. So if someone is not able to speak for themselves, perhaps they're in a terminal condition like a coma or a vegetative state, they may have left what's called a living will or an advanced directive to give their family an idea of what they would want to have happen. Do they still want life prolonging treatment or do they want it withdrawn in that case? The smaller group of people wants their life prolonged. It might be religious or cultural reasons. I've met with some people who just plain don't want to think about it and would rather not have that document at all. And so people's preferences really are in a broad range. Most of the time people do not want their life artificially prolonged if the treatment is not allowing them to get better. They still want comfort care, but they might say, I want the care for 30 days and then it's okay to withdraw it. And it's my job to help put that down in writing for them so that their loved ones can follow it. And in these cases, it's important for me to inform my clients about what their options are and to ultimately support them in whatever outcome they would choose. 
Another way that open-mindedness came up in my practice recently was, I'll give you some background here. A lot of what I do is help when someone has passed away. They might have a house that was in their name. A lot of times people's homes are their biggest assets, uh, worth the most in their estate. And in this family, the parents had formed a trust, a revocable trust to own their house and to pass it to their child when they passed away. A trust is often used to avoid probate court, to hopefully have assets passed through the trust rather than a public court proceeding. And the child in this scenario was sitting in front of me and said, I'm the sole beneficiary of the trust. I need the house transferred out of my parents' trust into my name. And in this case, it was a gentleman sitting in front of me. When I paged through the trust to see if there was any additional steps that would need to be followed before we got to this point of the, of the house going to this gentleman, I discovered that the sole beneficiary in the trust was a female's name. And I took a few minutes to think about how I could bring this question up respectfully to make sure that I was sitting in front of the person who was actually the beneficiary of this trust. And I started off by saying, I believe you. I remember you said that you're the sole beneficiary, but I'm looking at a, at a female name here. Can you please explain? And so then he did. He said that my name used to be so-and-so, and now it's this, and he had all the records to prove it, and I had the information that I needed to help him with the deed. And that was really all of the detail that we got into about it, but it was a way for me to help him accomplish what he wanted, to help him feel comfortable enough to trust me, to, in a matter of a half an hour, <laughs> tell me what he needed and some of the details behind it. And I think a lot of what I learned in my applied ethics classes and speaking about scenarios um, having to do with um, gay marriage, abortion, and other things helped prepare me for meeting all kinds of people in my work and focusing on what they might need from me as far as my legal service services. One of the last and most important skills that I use on a daily basis is empathy. I don't believe you have to be a jerk to be an attorney. I think too often our, the members of our profession are um, expected to be a certain way, even joked about. And you might not know, attorneys have a disproportionate um, level of depression. So attorneys have a higher amount of depression than the normal population and something I didn't realize until I went to a continuing legal education class was that that could be largely in part to how people in society view attorneys, how there are jokes made. And I've been in that situation where a client is trying to connect with me and, and makes an attorney type of joke. And I think I'm getting to the point where I'll just say I don't practice that kind of law <laughs> and just move on. Um, I think that another reason attorneys probably have a higher amount of depression than the regular population is just because of the sheer workload. Um, if you or someone you know are interested in becoming an attorney, be realistic about the amount of time that it will take you to do well in your career. During college, I was very focused on what law school would be like, but I should have thought more about what practicing law would be like as well uh, once I got past the law school hurdle. So using good time management skills and learning from other professionals I think helps you excel as an attorney to deal with those more difficult parts of the profession. And something that really keeps me engaged and motivated is how much I care about my clients. 
When I was here at ASU, I took a class called Adult Career Development. And looking back, it's kind of funny because the professor, Linda Perso, asked uh, pretty early on what I thought I might want to do, and I really was not sure. And I thought maybe I would be a life coach. And she said, Christine, you need life experience to be a life coach. <laughs> Think about something else. <laughs> and so I had considered going to law school when I was in high school. Because of the difficult time I had my first year of college, I abandoned that idea temporarily and really got pulled back into it once m my grades improved. But during this career class, I thought that I might want to become a chaplain. So I was immersed in religious and philosophy studies, and that was the competing idea that I had, possibly becoming a chaplain or going to law school. And so during this class, I became a volunteer with Hospice of the Valley, and I continue my service to this day through Hospice of the Valley, and it's really given me a, a perspective of the gravity of life and death. When, when I'm focused on work and meeting my commitments to my clients, it's really easy to get wrapped up in myself and all of the things that I have to do. And continuing volunteer work with hospice adds perspective to my life. And a big part of what I do is I give respite to caretakers who are caring for loved ones. I might visit their home so that their caretaker can go out and do errands. It doesn't seem like they hardly ever do anything for fun that I know of. It's usually their own doctor's appointments or their own errands, but I think it's meant so that the caretakers could go and relax, go to a park or do other things if they wished to. And when I was at ASU during this class, I met a patient who was toward the end of life. It was my first experience really being at a bedside with someone who was actively dying, and I saw the progression from when she was alert, experiencing dementia, but alert, in a way where I could spend time with her. She told me that I could massage her hands with lotion, but it got to the point where she couldn't consent to something like that later on. But I spent time with her because her family was out of state, and she was sort of known among the nurses as a perpetual call button presser. <laughs> and so uh, I think I gave her company that she really desired. But there was a point where after a few shifts, she passed away. And it was very important to me during my undergraduate studies to learn something like that. And it even impacts my profession now because I speak with people about really hard questions. I had a client who wanted things to be as smooth as possible if he passed away. He didn't want his wife to have to deal with anything hard. He wanted his children to have an easy time if they both passed away, meaning not having to deal with a lot of procedure and things like that. When I got to the point of presenting his documents to him, he would not come in and sign them. I didn't understand why. I kept asking him why. And he was convinced that he would die as soon as he signed his documents. And I hadn't heard that before, but I respected his feelings and ultimately did get him in to sign and finalize the documents. But it's perspectives like that that I learn from people all the time. And it's important, I think, as an attorney to listen to your clients, to empathize with them where you can. Um, when I've had a client go through a difficult time of her mother passing away, we've had to have difficult meetings about a house that needs to be sold. It's a common theme. 
and she is often very stressed before coming in to meet with me, but then as soon as she's there in person, there is this calm that comes over her, and she has said before to me that she is comforted when she meets with me. I am honored that she feels that way, and at the same time, I am trying to do what's best for her in an efficient manner, because every time that I am working on her behalf, she is being billed by my law firm at an hourly rate. And so some of what's been difficult for me is adjusting to the business side of practicing law as well. And again, that's where more experienced attorneys come in on learning how to handle discussions with clients about attorney's fees to make sure that people are fully informed about the structure and understanding that I'm approachable if they have questions or concerns. They will not be billed about conversations about attorney's fees. Sometimes people are surprised by that. They think they're going to be charged for everything, but that's just not the case. So that's only one small part of my job. What I find much more fulfilling is the interactions that I have with people. And what's been difficult in some ways, but also fulfilling in others is that I will help a client with a will who then passes away. And I will have the opportunity to help their family with what the will says. And I might even have the chance to help that person with their own will. It's an ongoing cycle that I am honored to be a part of. And I am hoping that I can continue to use my experience to benefit my clients. And the area of wills and trusts is, is a fulfilling area of law. When, when people come to talk to attorneys, it's not always for the best reasons. It, it might be because they're dealing with problems or issues in their life. But I'm glad that I've found this, this little niche in the law to help people um, accomplish their goals and wishes and care for their loved ones in a way that is a gift to them. To, to plan your will or your trust is a way to clarify what you would want to minimize potential disputes and ultimately carry out what your wishes are if you're unable to speak for yourself anymore, whether it be because you're disabled or because you've passed away. Thank you.